what happened with the evolution of this digital technologies, right? Primarily, we all know that internet gave us a lot of freedom, freedom of information, right? I could uh, now access information that was made available to me by some organizations. Uh, this has a history going back all the way to 1969 when the initial uh, defense net was set up, which primarily was the initial World Wide Web or the web that was there, which was called the intranet among all the defense organizations in the United States. So they started sharing their information on this web, okay, which was a select, selected number of nodes or servers that are connected to that, which is called the WAN, Wide Area Network. And they started expanding on it. Then came in the TCP IP protocol, which enabled primarily you to now interact and pass messages and information over the internet. So that led to having browsers like Netscape or Mosaic, the initial versions, okay? And uh, through that, you could now access information or you could host pages on the internet. Now, what happened here was typically all this information or whatever the servers, they are all controlled by corporations. So whatever news, whatever information was there was all controlled and shared by these entities, right? That is the first cut off the internet. What you could do maximum is you could have a browser and connect to a website and see what information is there. So that helped you to get information. Now, the next version of it, which started off around 1996, which we call the web one. Primarily it was like, it said that, okay, it is read only. You're seeing information. Only it is one way from the provider to you. There was no way you could give any feedback then. Okay. Uh, not much of information could be dynamic. When we say dynamic, once you put in that information, it used to be there unless somebody went and changed it. Okay. Uh, so it was not like real-time information. So that's where it became static content. And you had to log in or you had to give in some access or data, including your IP address, probably your username, your email ID, whatnot. Okay. And all these were captured by the centralized server, which was controlled by these centralized entities. Okay. And that information for a period of time, they realized that they could make money. How do they make money? They started doing analytics on that targeted, okay, saying that, okay, this person visits this website so many times. Uh, he bought so much of items as we moved forward into Web 2. Okay, it became much more uh, easier for them. Uh, web 1, there was no payments mechanism, right? Because it was just information that was being shared. Subsequently, Web 2 came in, which gave a flexibility of both reading and writing information. Right, So I could comment back. So then there were these comments that are enabled. So I could provide my comment. I could share some information on that. Right? So it became a little bit of flexible bi-directional. And uh, then you got all these apps coming in, social media apps, which are there, where you started putting in information and it became a little bit dynamic because now information could be shared uh, both by the companies and by you. But then the challenge was still, everything was controlled by centralized entities. Majority, even today, all the social media companies and the big tech, as you know, okay. Uh, and this gave them much more information about you, your behavior and everything. And they really make money out of it, right? Your behavior on the internet is a mine, a data mine for these companies, which do analytics on it. And then they're able to predict much better about what you do next than you know. Today, that's the situation. Uh, with advent of uh, food, uh, uh, cloud food mechanisms like uh, Swiggy and others, okay? They have a complete history of what you eat, how much you eat, when and all, and they'll keep promoting it, saying that, okay, buy this now, you'll get 50% discount. How will you how will you know that? Because you already done that earlier. So that behavior is captured and then they translate into more offers or more deals for them. And this gave also a mechanism of making payments through your credit cards or bank accounts. And they entice you through reward points or offers. So a little bit of reward is given to the end user, right? As a consumer, you do get some benefit uh, where they share some offers or they give a money back, whatever that happens, which has been the trend so far. Uh, this is what Web2 is. And this is where majority of the population today is still 
involved or engaged with. Uh, around 2015 or 16, okay, uh, when uh, things started coming into much more evolved on the cryptocurrency space uh, with the development of better or let me say multiple blockchains uh, till probably 2013 uh, bitcoin was the only blockchain that was available public blockchain uh, then ethereum came into play and then from 2015 a host of them started developing uh, their own blockchains uh, all with the idea of having public which means that uh, a very clear indication of not being centralized. But there are still a few blockchains which are still uh, controlled by entities. Okay, uh, They are called uh, enterprise or uh, corporate uh, blockchains. Okay, And these are controlled by companies to enable the, whatever information they have within the company. But majority of the development and the majority of the advances in this technology is happening on the public side, the public blockchains. Now, what does Web3 mean? And what is it that you get out of it if you participate in this uh, upcoming or evolving technology? Uh, this technology enables, enables you to read information, write information, and you also own that information, right? We'll see how that is possible. Uh, it is more multi-user, multi-participation, and everything is like interconnected here. So it is not that just two, two people connect and they have a discussion or uh, they have information sharing. It can be much more than that. Uh, you and I, apart from the companies which are participating in this, can build applications. You have the equal right to deploy your applications on this platform. Nobody can restrict you. Right. For example, if uh, you had an application that is very similar competing with uh, what happens with Amazon, okay, uh, when you deploy it, you are looking at it in some web space, right? Servers. Now there have been challenges where some of them have been taken down for whatever reason, right? Or even social media platforms have been restricted, or user have been thrown out. Now in this technology you really don't have that mechanism because it is not controlled in a single location or by a single entity. And you and I can participate in this, develop our own applications and deploy on the same platform, which is available to all the people, right? Uh, this is still evolving uh, tech, uh, though there has been significant improvement. Uh, there'll be much more involvement with the participation of AI, 3D and advanced technologies that are uh, also evolving as we have seen. And uh, the key differentiator here is that when you participate on Web3, you are primarily anonymous, okay? We'll see there are certain uh, layers uh, that have been mandated because of uh, the need for certain regulatory aspects where you have to do some KYC if you want to participate in certain aspects. But majority of the Web3 world is anonymous. You can participate in it without anybody's permission, right? Uh, and of course, everything is distributed, decentralized, and the majority of the communication or the way the information passes out is peer-to-peer. -peer. We'll see what it means. And here, uh, the rewards that come out of participation are enormous. Uh, the question is why? If you look at Web2, if you make an order of say thousand rupees or a hundred dollars, okay, probably not every order you will get a payback or a reward, right? Whereas when you get into participation, when I say participation, it is not just a transaction. Uh, when you participate in communities, when you participate in projects that are developing applications for these technologies or on this platform, okay. Uh, by the very nature of what this technology advocates, okay, majority of these projects reward their participants who help them in testing the project over the period of time, right? So when you participate in a community, let's say you are a AI specialist or you are an artist, okay, somebody is developing a platform uh, that is going to be on Web3, uh, supporting all these features, 
and you feel that, okay, this is something which I would like to contribute. Now, you may not have a programming knowledge or a technical knowledge, but whatever area you are, and if you feel that project is impacting your area, you can give a feedback and participate in the community. community. You can uh, become an advocate for that. Okay. And majority of these projects, they do reward. Now, how does that reward come? That reward comes through a mechanism of what are called cryptocurrencies or tokens. Now, each of these platforms, like Bitcoin, okay, Bitcoin is a network. When I say network, it is a network that interacts on the internet. It has got its own nodes, which are the servers. Okay, it has got its own database, okay, which is a ledger, what is called, not necessarily a database, but something called a ledger where information is stored, stored. And this interacts on the same internet where the rest of the world lives on. But what matters is the way in which this connects. That's what is called the Bitcoin network, right? And Bitcoin also is a protocol like TCP IP because you are going to be communicating with only certain nodes, you're passing information, you're passing your currency, Bitcoin on that, right? Bitcoin is also a currency because it has value. There is some token identity, a virtual token that is available on the web, on this Bitcoin network supported by Bitcoin protocol, right? So majority of these platforms, they will have their own tokens. The idea behind is that these tokens are a way of transferring value on the internet, right? So whenever you hear about cryptocurrency or tokens, the idea is that you are transferring value. Now, if you look at web two or web one, you could always share information. Right? There is no constraint there. But how do you share value on the internet? That was not possible. For example, in Web 2, let's say there is a good painting which is done. Somebody takes a photograph of it, makes a JPEG. Now, there can be hundreds of such JPEGs created because it's just a cut and paste or you can copy the same. There was no single, what you call, ownership kind of a tag that could be put on to one particular JPEG. But then when we move into web 3.0, there is a derivative of these tokens or a concept called non-fungible tokens or NFTs, which we'll look at it in the future. There, you're primarily going to be having a mechanism which can plug in to say that, okay, this is the original and this is the author who has created this particular digital artifact or asset. 